this is a J hat dot product with seven meters I hat plus six meters J hat. Well, you can foil. So let's just sort of, I'll, so let's do it the long way first, and then we won't do it the long way again. So foil, we multiply the first ones together. So I get 28, I'll worry about units at the end, I hat dot I hat, and then outer plus 24 I hat dot J hat minus 21 J hat dot I hat minus 18 J hat dot J hat. Well, I have two unit vectors here in the same direction. What is I hat dot I hat? Okay, the I hat squared, but what does that equal? Did you just say it? One. Yeah, one. The magnitude of, multiply the magnitudes of each. So that's one times one, times the cosine of the angle between them. Well, if I have two vectors that are identical, the angle between them is, yeah, and cosine of zero is, one. Yes, there you go, like the confidence. So that's just 28. Plus, I hat dot J hat. directions does not do it. Your, your hand gesture is right. The word that I heard was not. What is the relative direction between them? Perpendicular. Yeah, they're perpendicular to each other. Opposing is like that. They're perpendicular to each other. But dot product multiplies parallel parts. There's nothing parallel there. So that is zero. Plus j dot i. J dot J. So the answer to this would be 10 Newton meters. Now, if you have one vector in polar form and one rectangular form, you need to convert one of them to the other form so that you can use one of these two methods. Or have written them programmed your calculator to handle it. All right, questions to hear before we actually bring it back to physics. This being math so far. All right. I'm going to put something up here. If you've had calculus, this might make sense. If you haven't had calculus, don't worry about it. This is just a side note. Uh, work officially is defined as the integral of f dot dx. As far as we're concerned, f times delta x. All right. Based on Newton's second law, what does f equal? So this should be equal to mass times the acceleration dot delta x. What's the formula for acceleration? B squared over r. Uh, that would be centripetal specifically. Um, delta x a hat. That would be velocity, average velocity. Uh, that is true, but then we'd be going in circles. I was looking for the chapter two definition.
there we go. So this would be mass times change in velocity over a change in time or time. And dot displacement. Uh, displacement is change in position. What are the cake formulas? What are the displacement equals? Vi doesn't equal Vi um, times time. Oh, the other one. Vi one x. I think you're. The uh, velocity initial plus velocity final is just two times time. So, so vi plus vf. If acceleration is constant, this is valid. Divided by two times time. All right. So those are the ones that I want. We're doing still have the dot right there. Time is a scalar. I don't have to worry about dot products with scalars there. So whatever. Time's going to cancel out. So now I'm left with mass times the change in velocity times the average velocity. Uh, this half, the divided by two, that's just, I'm going to factor that half out, so I end up with work so far, and this is total work, because if F equals MA, that's got to be total force. That is equal to, I'm now down to mass, one half mass times final velocity minus initial velocity, dot initial velocity plus final velocity. Divided by two goes out front and the times canceled out. But now I've got these vector things I need to multiply. Well, I don't have directions here, so uh, I'm going to float. So I got one half mass times, so VF dot VI. And then outer plus VF dot vf dot vf uh, inner minus vi dot vi and then last minus vi dot vf I think that's the most we have to write in any one line, so it's gonna we're gonna simplify it. So I got three terms, sorry, if I can count. I have four terms here. Again, terms are things that are added or subtracted, factors are things that are multiplied or divided. I have four terms here, two of which are gonna cancel each other out. Which two will cancel? Yep, I got VF dot VI there. I have VI dot VF minus VI dot VF. Again, commutative property holds, so the order in which I multiply does not matter. So that will cancel out with that. So now I'm left with, now I have VI dot VI. It is a scalar product. If we think back to the formula, dot B is equal to the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the cosine of the angle between them. So now I have VI dot VI. Well, the magnitude of that is whatever the speed is times VI times the cosine of the angle between them. Well, what is the angle between a vector and itself? And cosine of zero. So what I'm left with in a fading and dying marker is if I do a dot product with itself, that's just the magnitude squared. So this VF dot VF is just the final speed squared. 
minus vi dot vi, which is the minus is the initial speed squared. If I distribute, I get one half m vf squared minus one half m vi squared. It may not look like much, but this is actually rather important. The next step is becomes even more critical. I have one half mv squared showing up twice. Physicists and their desire not to write much said, you know what? Let's come up with a letter to symbolize it. So how about a capital K? Well, a capital K equal one half mv squared. Therefore, this would just be k final minus k initial. In other words, delta k. So we now have left with the total work being done on an object is equal to the change in k. This K here is called, I'm using the letter K because that K represents kinetic energy. This relationship right here is known as the work energy theorem. Now, I do not believe it should be called a theorem because it is true because we define kinetic energy and work the way we did, but for whatever reason, it's still called a theorem. There will be three work energy relationships. This is the officially the theorem, but we do have two others that we need to deal with. Questions to here? more bit of vocabulary, set of vocabulary. We now need to talk about forces and the two types. I'm not talking F Tom. We're talking there all forces can be broken into one of two types. There are conservative forces. And the opposite of conservative, and it's not liberal. They got really clever with the name here non-conservative. Conservative forces change energy energy from one type to another. From one type to another. Non-conservative forces transfer energy <coughs> from one object to another. There is a formal definition for conservative forces that involves calculus. We are going to skip that and go for sort of a quick and dirty definition here. A conservative force is any force that is in the following list. Of the forces we have talked about so far, here are all the forces that fall under conservative. Gravitational force, that is the whole list. That does include weight. Weight is a, is a form of gravitational force. Weight would fall under that. Therefore, non-conservative forces is normal force, friction. Friction is a classic non-conservative. Uh, so it's pretty uh, tension, non-conservative. 
Now, within this course, we will also deal with a couple other conservative forces, the elastic force, and that's pretty much it for this course. In 152, the electric force and magnetic force are also conservative, and then pretty much everything else is not conservative. Why do you speculate? Or speculate why it's called conservative or non-conservative? What does conserved mean? Conservative forces conserve energy. Non-conservative forces don't conserve energy. It's as simple as that. Which means that if I have non-conservative work happening, and non-conservative work would be the non-conservative force, or forces, however many we have, times displacement, my conservative forces means that I'm, there's a change in energy. That's the second of the work energy relationships. So if conservative forces are changing energy from one, from one form to another, then there has to be, well, I have kinetic energy. There's got to be another type of energy here. This E right here is total energy. So I've got to have another type of energy involved. Because if, if I'm transferring from one type to another, there's got to be something other than just kinetic. All right, so I have a pin here. We will assume at rest. If I let go, what will happen? OK, while it is at rest, what is the kinetic energy of the pen? If I let go, will the kinetic energy stay zero? Okay, so my kinetic energy is changing. The force acting on it when I let go will be? Which is conservative, so energy is conserved. So this, this energy, kinetic energy, has gotta be coming from somewhere. I go from zero kinetic energy to having kinetic energy. Conservative forces transfer from one type to another, so there is something about well, what's changing here is the position. So there's something about the position which has, which produces another type of energy. And so kinetic energy is the energy of movement. That's the term kinetic. Potential energy is the other type. Potential energy is the energy. Potential. Energy is the energy of position. Some textbooks will talk about it's the because it has the energy for the potential to do work, but I never care for that definition. The symbol for potential energy, as you would expect, is a capital U. I think the textbook uses PE. I will, I will use the capital U. So we have the energy of motion, we have the energy of position. In essence, how much work does it take to put an object into its current position from wherever potential energy is zero? And there's a third type that is that I bring up mainly as a side note. It doesn't really come into impact until it's near the end of physics 152. But the third type, you know the formula for it, it's called rest energy.
Now I said you know the formula for it, but probably you're going, I don't know the formula for that. I'll start you out. E equals squared. There we go. The only difference I think is that n sub zero is c squared. That's rest energy. That's the energy just because an object has mass. So we have energy because it moves, we have energy because it's someplace, and we have energy because it has mass. Now, as we have found out within the past hundred years, there are some particles that do not have a rest mass. This m sub zero is rest mass. That is the mass of an object when it is at rest relative to whatever you're using to measure it. So every time you found the mass in lab, you're finding the rest mass because that balance is at rest relative to what's sitting on it. All right, this will come back somewhere near the end of Physics 152. Or not, depends on who's teaching it. If you see a reference to mechanical energy, that's just kinetic plus potential energies. through a scenario. I have an object here, some mass m. The kinetic is zero and the potential energy we'll just say is 100 joules. Joule being a unit of energy. It falls because of the gravitational force pulling on it. At this point right here, the kinetic energy is 30 joules. What is the potential energy? 70 joules. Because the total stays constant. 